Jeff, good to see you, my friend. Likewise. How you doing? Yeah, I'm good, actually. As we spoke about before, making trying to make sense of this crazy world. Hey, I, you've been on Real Vision a number of times, but just for people who haven't um, gotten to know you yet, just give a little bit about what you do and a bit of your background and your journey into crypto, just because it always anchors it for people and people get a good understanding of how you think. Yeah, absolutely. And, and first, thanks for having me back. So I'm Jeff Dorman. I'm the Chief Investment Officer uh, at ARCA. ARCA is a full service asset management firm uh, with offices now uh, mostly in Los Angeles and New York, but around the world. Uh, you know, we cater to all different facets of the digital asset market. We've got five different fund strategies right now from liquid uh, directional research based digital asset fund strategies to market neutral yield strategies to private venture and even sort of niche NFT funds. Uh, but we've grown, you know, entirely uh, in the digital asset space now for the last five years. Uh, and before that, I was a I was a TradFi guy, you know, investment banker at Lehman Brothers, bond trader at Merrill Lynch. Uh, uh, worked at Citadel and some other equity and debt funds. Um, so really spent the first, you know, 15, 20 years of my career looking at the, you know, the same factors that are now driving digital assets. <laughs> I thought I had escaped, but I'm getting sucked right back in. <laughs> How did you, what, what, give me your crypto journey and why you end up sort of setting up Arca? Cause you were pretty early in setting up a crypto hedge fund. So I'd love to hear that process. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, my journey is probably very similar to a lot of people, only maybe a few years earlier in that, you know, the first time I heard about Bitcoin, I laughed and dismissed it and thought it was a joke. Um, you know, it was three years after the first time I heard about it that I actually invested in it. Um, so I think, you know, similar journey. At first, I was like, that makes no sense. That's crazy. Then a few years later, it was like, actually, maybe it's not so crazy. Maybe I'll put a little bit of my own money into it. And then a few years later, it was like, actually, the rest of the world is crazy. This makes all the sense <laughs> in the world. And, um, but I think for me, starting Arca was really when I moved away from Bitcoin and started to see what the rest of uh, the world, how the rest of the world could be affected by uh, blockchain technology and digital assets. And it, it, you know, it doesn't mean I'm not still bullish on Bitcoin. I certainly am. Um, but to me, Bitcoin wasn't a career. Bitcoin was like a hobby, whereas the rest of the digital asset world is more of a career. Because in, in my opinion, I think digital assets are the greatest capital formation customer bootstrapping and uh, sta uh, stakeholder alignment tool that we've ever seen. And it, it really, in my opinion, kind of throws uh, uh, on its head what the meaning of equity is and what the meaning of debt is. And, you know, I, I really believe in a world where digital assets aren't even an asset class. It's really just the technology that's going to underpin all asset classes. So you already had currencies with Bitcoin. But you're ultimately going to have your equity tokens, your debt tokens, your commodity tokens, your real estate tokens, your, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, data tokens. You know, I think everything is ultimately going to be encompassed with blockchain and a token, and that's the world we're headed towards. So when we set up Arca, it was it was to capitalize on just that, right? We wanted to give investors the exposure to the growth of the price action of some of these tokens, but we also wanted to build products that. Um, you, you know, utilize the technology in the same way that the ETF turned the you know 4 p.m. mutual fund on its head. You know, we think digital assets are going to turn ETFs on their head and ultimately be the way you know every single investor in the world holds assets. What year did you start Arca? Officially, 2018. I think we put the building blocks in place in 2017, but we uh, we launched our first fund in 2018. So you launched straight into a bear market. Yeah. <laughs> How did that feel? Talk, talk me through that, because, you know, obviously we're all made from our experiences. So we kind of understand sure. the context of the world, often from how we first started in markets. So you launch straight into a bear market. What the hell do you do? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, there's a couple of things, right? So, so first and foremost, it was a great time to learn. Um, you know, now we're all working 24-7 and, you know, the amount of investor interest and media interest, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's nonstop. Whereas... In 2018, you could just read and talk to people and, and really kind of come up with your valuation techniques that you're going to use in this market. So when we first entered the market, there was really only three kinds of investors. Um, you had your Bitcoin-only investors, who some of them have evolved. Some of them are still Bitcoin-only investors, but you know, largely either macro investors or they're you know, government libertarians, right, who, who you know, just want to completely free themselves of, of, of government anarchy. Um, you know, then you had your quantitative algo, uh, uh, you know, systematic type funds who were certainly taking advantage of the vol and the correlations, but but maybe weren't really that interested or focused on what these assets really were and how to value them, which is why, 
the majority of those funds still focus on the 2017 legacy crop of your, you know, Bitcoins, Bitcoin Cash, Litecoins, Ripples, things like that. Uh, and then you had your venture investors who, you know, were probably the most forward looking in terms of understanding where else this technology could be applied. But in our opinion, they weren't taking advantage of the liquidity and the nuances of digital assets, meaning, you know, they weren't looking at things like tokenomics or, you know, what it means to have a token backed by assets or, you know, all the different, um, you know, characteristics that now make this uh, uh, investment set so unique. You know, the, the, the venture playbook was, was largely just, you know, spray and pray and put you know, money into everything and see which ones grow and which ones don't, which, which is totally fine, but it just wasn't all encompassing of where we thought this was headed. So in 2018, with the bear market, we just started developing our own techniques, right? You know, we, we started to look into, you know, what parts of the Graham and Dodd valuation can we apply to this, you know, investment set? What part of Frank Fabozzi, you know, fixed income Bible uh, uh, properties can we apply to digital assets? And, and where do we need new techniques, right? How do we account for things like supply sinks and um, amortizations and, you know, uh, uh, the utility function of these digital assets in addition to the financial function. Um, so, so 2018 was really just a lot of learning. And it was, in retrospect, a great time to, to launch a fund, um, you know, because we were able to uh, uh, dis- figure out exactly where we wanted to go as a firm, what kind of strategies we wanted to build and, and how to speak the language to, to investors so that when, you know, 2019, 2020, 2021 came along, you know, we were miles ahead in terms of being able to have the operational infrastructure, the fiduciary uh, capabilities, the, um, you know, reporting requirements to be able to take in institutional money. And, and, and you know, like most in this industry, we've, we've exploded in terms of assets. But, but, but more importantly, I think we've exploded in terms of education and, and helping the masses learn about what this industry really is. And so your model for the main fund is, is really interesting. As you said, you, you tend to use a different type of valuation tool than most people look at. You know, a lot of people had no valuation tool and were just using technical analysis. Um, others, you know, like myself, I tend to use more uh, Metcalf's law style analysis, you know, network growth models. But you looked at bottoms up because I think you started in a bear market. So then what you're trying to find out is what you can buy that's less risky. So my guess is that applies now at this point in the cycle as well, where we've had this mm-hmm. one year huge range um, with kind of declining interest in the space a little bit somewhat. Um, how are you using that framework now? And um, what, what are you uncovering? Is there value around yet or still not there yet? Yeah, I, I, there's definitely value. What there isn't is value investors, right? You know, value only has value if the other people who look at it that way. Um, you know, what this space is missing is that growth equity investor or that long only mutual fund investor that, you know, takes you from the early stage VC to the retail IPO, right? You know, in the traditional uh, debt and equity world, you have all these uh, uh, funds in the middle that sort of nurture the growth of public uh, companies. We don't really have that yet in digital assets, right? You have these huge early stage VCs that are raising money hand over fist and throwing money at every private project they can, but they've got nowhere to go with that token once it goes public other than retail and a few funds like us. Um, so I think it's, it's, not, it's not that there's not value, it's just that there isn't a value investor. But, but the way we look at it is simply, um, first we had to define a taxonomy, right? That was the most important part of this journey. We actually, we, we put together a nice infographic on our website and distributed it out. Uh, if anyone wants to see it, it's on our website at AR.ca. But first we had to define a taxonomy. And, and we think of it a lot like the fixed income world, right? The fixed income world has very, di- very different issuer types, right? From government, munis, corporates. Um, it has very different bond ratings. It has very different types of tokens from your, you know, callable bonds, to potables, convertibles, preferreds. Uh, uh, you know, you have different covenants within bonds. Um, that's kind of how we had to map out the digital asset space, right? So first it was, who are the issuers? Well, the issuers can be governments like your CBDCs. It can be completely decentralized, you know, organizations or DAOs. It can be an individual, right? You know, somebody who's just issuing a token on behalf of themselves for their own income. Um, it can be, a, you know, a flat out corporation like a Binance or an FTX. So first it was, who are the issuers? Then it was, well, where do they fall on the spectrum from fully decentralized to centralized or, or anywhere in between? Um, you know, then we had to figure out, well, what is the token type, right? Is it a currency, just a medium of exchange within a network? Um, or is it an asset backed token, something like, you know, uh, whether it's a security token backed by like, you know, real real estate or something like Nexus Mutual that's backed by the assets in the capital pool? Um, and then, you know, is it a pass through token, you know, something that has, 
you know, hybrid qualities that where it's quasi equity, quasi, you know, membership or loyalty reward card, where it actually has some sort of pass through characteristics. And we can get into that in a minute. Um, and then it was, well, what are the actual features of the token, right? Does it have an inflation schedule or an amortization schedule? Does it have a dividend or a buyback feature? Um, you know, once we define that taxonomy, then value investing is really easy, right? You look for those tokens that fit certain characteristics and certain properties. Um, you know, so for example, one of the one of the analogies uh, uh, you know we use with people all the time is is you know imagine if Amazon Prime and Amazon shares were one uh, uh, were one buyable asset instead of the way it is right now. Right, right now you could be an Amazon shareholder, or you could be an Amazon Prime member, but there's no reason you have to be both. A lot of people are both, but you don't have to be both. In the token world, you kind of have to be both, right? If you want to be the ups, if you want to earn the upside of Amazon's growth through the shares, but you also want to be a member of the Amazon network and earn the free shipping, the Whole Foods discounts, the movies, the music, well, now you can do both of those at the same time by having a token, right? The token might give you member benefit type privileges and discounts, but it'll also give you some form of financial upside through the form of a buyback or a dividend or something else, you know, uh, uh, ascribed to the profits and growth of the business. So B and B is the perfect one to to explain when we go to investors for the first time. We'll say, look what Binance did. Binance is a regular company. There's nothing centralized about them. They have debt. They have equity. They have a board of directors. They have a CEO. But they were one of the first to introduce one of these pass-through kind of hybrid tokens, right? The BNB token was issued um, with a fixed amount of tokens. They encouraged their customers to buy it. Um, their customers, if they owned the BNB token, got all kinds of member discounts. First, it was just um, you know a, tr a reduction of trading fees, but over time they added to it, just like Amazon Prime did. And over time, now they can uh, a BNB uh, owner could get um, they can use the BNB token for collateral to trade options and futures. Um, you know, they could use it to get first dibs on new tokens that Binance issues issues to their customers. Uh, you could even use it for discounts for travel around Asia. So just like Amazon Prime, Binance increased the utility benefits of owning the BNB token. But also on the financial side, just like Amazon shares, Binance said, we're going to take 20% of our profits and we're going to use it to buy back tokens in the open market. So there's your, you know, there's your Graham and Dodd free cash flow modeling. You, you know, model the, ca the revenues and cash flows of the business and you look at how that affects the Binance token from a free cash flow standpoint. But more importantly, what it does is unlike Amazon, where you could be an Amazon Prime member and have no benefits at all if Amazon grows, or you can be an Amazon shareholder and do nothing to influence the growth of that company. If you're a BNB token holder, you're doing both, right? You are in, you become an evangelist overnight because you want every single person in the world to use Binance because you're getting paid through the BNB token if they do. So there's your stakeholder alignment. There's your um, you know, uh, customer bootstrapping. And I think that's the very reason why Binance is the fastest growing unicorn in history going from nothing in 2018 to, you know, what, a three, $400 billion enterprise value today. Um, so that's, that's what got excited to me in 2018. And that's what we look for today. We look for these companies. That's an example of a community or social token, really. Um, you know, yeah. it's a system of money within a network, within a community. Absolutely. And yeah, FTX obviously did the same. And they've both been phenomenally successful. And what I find really interesting is they live at a different tier above equity and debt. The token is a whole different asset class. Yeah. And it kind of values community on the balance sheet. Um, and I'm looking at this as also for brands and, you know, luxury brands, pop stars, everybody else. What you're doing is you're putting, you're putting, let's say, brand from being an intangible on the balance sheet to being a tangible. Um, and yeah. that becomes really interesting. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, I mean, the way the way I talk, you actually said it better than I say, but I always say, I think tokens are just a, a new part of the capital structure. Right? Your, equity is your, your equity is your claim on cash flows and revenues. Uh, your debt is your claim on assets. And your token is exactly what you just said. It's your claim on brand and social loyalty. Um, and as a result, once we get more clarity, certainly in the U.S., but even across Europe and Asia and everything else, I think every company in the world is going to have a token in their capital structure. I think you're going to see, you know, Starbucks will have debt and equity and they'll have a token which replaces their, you know, Starbucks cards. Um, you know, United Airlines will have debt and equity and they'll have a token which replaces their miles. And what you do is you start to, again, you, you start to align all of your stakeholders. Um, you know, there's no reason why I should be a United customer and not be a shareholder. That's crazy. Um, you know, there's no reason why I am a Starbucks shareholder, but I don't even drink coffee. That's crazy, right? You need to start aligning the people who actually make your company go with the people who are benefiting from its success. 
Um, and and, and the, the, the antithesis of that is the recent Airbnb and DoorDash IPOs. I mean, you can't come up with two companies that were built on the backs of regular people that rewarded none of those regular people. I mean, think about DoorDash, right? Everybody who cooks food, everybody who eats food, and everybody who rides a bike and delivers food got nothing from the DoorDash IPO, but it created hundreds of billions or a hundred billion dollars for investors, right? Airbnb, anybody who owns a home or likes to vacation, you know, none of them made any money off of the Airbnb IPO. Like that's crazy, right? You need to start aligning people in the same way. And to your point, right, it is a social construct. If you're going to be part of this member society, you should be encouraged to evangelize on its behalf and to profit when it succeeds. You know, I've been speaking um, at kind of these kind of closed door events with a lot of kind of very influential people, big corporations, media companies, and explaining this concept. And I can see it's blowing people's minds. Because, you know, I, I, you know, I explain it is what is the value of a Disney token? It is gigantic and it's probably more mm -hmm. than the equity of the firm. Yeah. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm doing the same thing. Like, we, you know, we're, we're speaking to pensions and endowments and sovereign wealth funds every day. And, and you can see that light bulb go off. You can see that aha moment where immediately somebody in the room will say something along the lines of, you just completely threw out the window everything I thought equity was. And you are basically making this argument that this is the best version ever of, you know, coordination and growth. And it's true. It's exactly what you said. A Disney token is way more valuable than Disney equity. It just absolutely is, right? We can, between all the member benefits of Disney Plus and, and in the park combined with a share of some sort of that profit. And it, it, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing how, how early it really is when you consider that none of these companies have even thought about this. And I joke all the time, wasn't it like a year ago or two years ago that one of the airlines decided to, uh, uh, they took their airline miles and they issued debt backed by the airline miles. And I'm like, what are you doing? This is the most debt encumbered industry in the world that goes bankrupt every seven years. And you're adding more debt to the balance sheet. Like there's a better system. There's a better way to do it. Why, are you, why is there not a single investment banker out there who figured this out yet? And um, it also so aligns interest so well because you and the customer or your network member are now on the same page. You're working for the same thing. So I think it throws marketing upside down because you don't need as many as much marketing costs because your network members, your token holders, are massively incentivized to grow the network and create a great community. Yeah, for sure. And it goes even deeper than corporations, right? Think about when universities start doing this, right? I have a child and on the day my child is born, I just, you know, I, I think he's going to go to Notre Dame. So I buy Notre Dame token. And in 18 years, if he or she decides not to go to Notre Dame, I just trade it for UCLA token or for Harvard token. And all of a sudden, if you're a, you know, if you're a donor or you're a booster, why are you just doing that as a tax write-off for a charity? Why not do it and you know get the token in return? And who knows what that token could be worth one day? Yeah, and the other thing I've looked at in, in that as well is I think that students will get tokenized because yeah. it's so much better than having student debt. So you have a token. Yeah. So then I can buy a basket of students from Notre Dame, you know, 2025 graduation year. I can short a basket of Harvard. You know, whatever it is you want to do, and what you're doing is creating a liquid market for students, and you can bet on individual students as well. You know, we're seeing these kind of applications coming th coming through, even even the ability yeah. to tokenize people's time. Oh, for sure. And and uh, you know, municipalities, same thing, right? I mean, how how many municipalities out there have done revenue bonds or go bonds forever to fund projects, right? Well, what, what if you issued a park token, and it's like, okay, you're, you know, we're fund this new development of the park, but if you own the token. Maybe you get to, you know, first dibs at concerts in the park or you get, you know, first in line to throw a birthday party for your children in the park. Like it just combines. All we're doing is we're combining economic incentive with member utility, right? It's all you're doing. It's, it's the most simple concept in the world. And again, every time we have this conversation, when people actually sit down and talk to you rather than just reading the propaganda of, you know, Bitcoin or Dogecoin. And again, I'm not I'm not anti Bitcoin, or anything, but it's like, you know, imagine Imagine if everybody in the equity world was starting from scratch and all they ever heard about was GameStop and AMC. You know, there wouldn't be a single equity investor left. They'd all be like, well, this is a joke of a market. I need to get out of here as fast as I can. But most people dismiss that because they know 
actually no, the equity market is a pretty safe and, and you know logical place. And AMC and GameStop are kind of anomalies, right? But ninety percent of the people we talk to in the digital asset market, the first thing they ever hear about is like Dogecoin and Bitcoin because that's all over the press. And if that's the first thing you ever hear about, you're like, okay, well, Dogecoin is makes no sense, and Bitcoin is you know maybe it makes sense, but it's kind of just a call option, or it's certainly you know no intrinsic value, right? It's just, it's just a value on on you know ultimately the demise of fiat currency. But they're dismissing this entire other world that you and I have been talking about now for 30 minutes. And you can even see the passion in our voice when we're talking about it. Like, it's so logical and so simple in concept. And it just takes a lot of time to get people to understand that this is what the digital asset market can be. Um, and and it's, 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 it's mind blowing, you know, when you think about all these possibilities that haven't even been explored. Yeah. You know, and I, I talk a lot about this because once you see it, you can't unsee it. And you see, this is probably going to be the biggest change in global business models in the shortest period of time we've ever seen. And yes, it's like the internet, but the internet was incremental value to shareholders in the end. But this is a whole different beast entirely. I think it's much bigger in terms of, I guess, wealth wealth generation effects. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, and and. and you know, alignment and coordination is probably the most important thing, right? And when these tokens are structured correctly, it solves for both of those. Um, and 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 then, you know, like like I said, from for us as value investors, I mean, we just have a lot of fun thinking about these new concepts. You know, all of us who grew up on Wall Street, you know, the first thing you had to do was you had to read the, what, 1,100-page Graham and Dodd book, right? Then you had to read the 1,300-page Fabozzi book. And it's like, you know, these are really fascinating concepts, and they're very academic in nature. But it wasn't, you know, it was already approved and established by everybody, right? You know, if you give 10 equity analysts the exact same information, they're basically going to come out with the exact same output because they're all using the exact same tried and true methodologies that Graham and Dodd and, you know, Buffett have been ascribing for, for decades with a few, you know, wrinkles here and there, like you said, Metcalf's Law and some of the ways that, that you value, you know, early stage tech companies. But for the most part, you know, equities and debt are all valued roughly the same. But if you give 10 digital asset investors the same inputs, they're all going to give you wildly different outputs, um, which is where all the alpha comes from from an investor standpoint, is that everybody has a different way of valuing you know, these tokens, or in some cases, not valuing them at all. But we have a lot of fun like that. Uh, you know, for example, we hired recently a, a really smart uh, guy named Nick Holtz, who is finishing his Yale MBA right now, but he worked at a macro fund for three years, went back to school, and now he's starting full-time with ARCA in the summer. He wrote a blog post for us recently saying, how do I value a layer one blockchain? Do I value it as a business or do I value it as a nation? And the idea was, well, if we value it as a business, it's really easy, right? A lot of these blockchains generate fees. And if you go to something like cryptofees.info, you can see exactly how much Ethereum generates in fees versus like a Solana or an Avalanche or a Luna. And it's interesting, but it's not complete because you know some layer one blockchains are designed to not have high fees and therefore they would get punished if you valued them you know, on a fee model. But then you can say, well, what if we valued them as a nation instead? And you thought about it as, okay, what if each blockchain was just a blank country, you know, that started from scratch? And eventually, if the roads are built and the schools are built and the businesses are built, then eventually not only do you have the tax revenue, but you also have this functioning currency within that country, which is what basically the token has become. And if you value these as a nation, you know, now all of a sudden it, it's a totally different argument. And something that doesn't screen well as a, as a, as a business might screen really well as a currency of a nation. And the whole point of this is like, I don't really know which one's right or wrong. They're both fascinating. But the point of this is, is none of it is out there in the public. This is all brand new that we're building from scratch. And it's, it's awesome. It's awesome to be a part of these new techniques rather than just adopting old techniques. So I spent a bit of time in Global Macro Investor trying to think about, okay, how do I, how do I want to value them? Because, you know, I, I think for me, Metcalfe's law, I think it's a, a Metcalfe's law for the major stuff works well, and I, I love the value investing idea as well for other stuff. And then there's a you know, there's a bunch of other ways you need to look at things. But what I did is I, I split down all the variables, and I came up with the fact that every blockchain I could find that I could get data on was explained essentially by volume traded multiplied by the number of active wallets. And that same formula is a perfect fit for everything from Bitcoin to XRP to ETH to Solana to everything. Um, and I thought that was very interesting, that basically one formula seemed to be exactly where the price is. It doesn't give you a forward forecast, which, you right. know, but that's stuff I'm going to start working on. But what it was, it, it explained the value of a network. And I thought that was really, really helpful. 
Yeah, and it's funny. I mean, like you said, I'm one of the earlier you know funds in the space. And I've actually never heard that before just now. So it just shows you I think, how yeah, wild. I think I'm the first person to have ever done it. I mean, I just. Yeah, and how cool is that, right? I mean, you've been investing for you know 30 years. I've been doing it for 20 years. And it's like, you know, most of the things we did in our career prior to digital assets, again, you're just accepting prior work and, and applying it, right? Here, we're creating these methodologies and these formulas from scratch. And, and it's, to, I've never been more excited as an investor, you know, getting into a, 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 an investment opportunity set that one, most people in the world aren't even, you know, thinking about yet, let alone actively invested in yet. Two, you have incredibly smart people from completely different backgrounds trying to come up with these valuation techniques. Um, you know, and three is we haven't even scratched the surface yet in terms of the type of investors, or sorry, the type of, of issuers they're going to have tokens in the future, right? So you just think about like, what is the sweet spot of investing? It's a growing investment set without growing competition. And that's kind of where we sit right now. I know. So I it's, mean, it's, as, as you know, I started a fund of funds and you know, disclosure, we're investors in ARCA, but um, it was exactly the same principle is like, well, the token world has got more complicated. There's massive amounts of complexity and it's just multiplying in size. I think the primary investments in hedge funds, about a billion dollars, the rest has come from performance. I mean, there's not a lot of money gone in versus 32 billion of VC went into the crypto markets. And so you just think it's almost impossible to arbitrage away all of the alpha because the space is growing too fast for the capital coming into it. So it's just an extraordinary opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, like I said, when we, when we have these meetings with some of these larger investors, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these uh, larger uh, allocators of capital, you know, they've been on our distribution list. You know, we do a lot of content. We do, you know, weekly blogs and monthly investor letters and all that stuff. We, we, have, we have big investors who have been on our distribution list for three, four years. And they're just now kind of pulling the trigger and allocating. And as everybody who's, you know, comes from the from the TradFi world knows, like the amount of money that's not in this space yet obviously dwarfs the amount of money that's in this space, right? So when the big checks start coming in, they're going to come in in sizes we've never seen before. But they're they're closer than ever and in, all, and, and in many cases starting to allocate because of exactly what we said here. Like they're starting to recognize that, you know, 60-40 portfolio, your 60 equity, 40 bond portfolio in is, is really in trouble in an inflationary, recessionary world. But digital assets might be a little bit recession proof, especially certain types of them. And they're starting to realize what we just talked about, about the coordination and the um, uh, 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 stakeholder alignment and the way that um, you know these networks can accrue value through through different method methodologies, um, and, and when you see that light bulb go off, there's always that one or two young you know kid in the room who's like been pushing always, for two years. Always, always. But but when, when you see the fifty or sixty year old you know equity investor who's like, wow, you're you're absolutely right. This is just better. And, and to your you know like things like you just said, like well yeah, a Disney token could and probably should have a higher valuation than Disney equity. They're just like their minds are blown. And it's it's just so exciting to me to think about all the different ways that we're going to be investing in tokens. I mean, we started four years ago with one fund where it was just a long bias directional fund looking for those value. But now, again, we have a yield fund. We have an NFT fund. You know, we have the early venture fund. You know, we might have a governance fund soon where we're doing, you know, basically you know, quasi activism or what we call constructivism. Um, you know, we're, 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 we're publicly becoming the board of directors, but in public governance uh, in some of these DeFi and decentralized um, uh, voting mechanisms where you can actually drive results of a business by being an active board member. You know, that's basically what being a token holder is for a decentralized entity. Is you're just a public board of uh, a board member. Um, and, and who knows, right? I mean, you know, we might have a muni fund one day or a college fund or all these things we're talking about, right? There might be a, a fund just dedicated to corporates with tokens on the balance sheet. Like we just, it's going to expand so quickly. Um, and, and I really think majority of the, um, you know, funds in the world are, are behind, right? A lot of them have dipped their toes in from a macro standpoint recently, and they're trading, you know, Bitcoin or some of the layer ones more from a macro standpoint. And that's why you're seeing some of these correlations tick up recently. Um, but you haven't seen the deep value investors, your growth equity, your credit guys get into the space yet. But but I think they will be very soon because this is just, you know, there's more nuance and more opportunity in, in what we're talking about here than anything they're looking at in the debt and equity world right now. Yeah, I mean, I think Brevin's new vehicle is astonishingly interesting as well. Um, so, Colleen, we're, we're getting on Real Vision shortly, but they're very interesting because they've actually, you know, famous macro players have actually come at it from the reverse. They've come at it as a crypto perspective you know they've started a 
you know, a uh, kind of venture studio, the accelerator, some sort of campus down in Austin, all sorts of amazing stuff. And it's like, yeah. okay, this is starting to change the industry. When the, the other thing that's coming is obviously the industry itself is going to get tokenized. Where are you in that process? Like Dow structures for investing or, you know, or however you think it might happen for, for Arca itself. Sure. So, um, you know, we actually have two sides of our business, right? So we have the asset management side, which is what I run, where we are investing investors' capital into the tokens that exist today. And then we have the lab side, where we're actually trying to do exactly that, right? Trying to think through where is this world headed from a tokenization standpoint, right? You know, we were the first to tokenize a mutual fund, for example. We have a, uh, we just wrote a white paper called the BTF, the Blockchain Transfer Fund, which is meant to be exactly like the ETF, right? It's a 40-act um, structure. But instead of the shares trading in your normal, you know, DTC bank and brokerage system, you know, the shares are all represented by an ERC token. And that's how the shares of the fund are, are transferred, right, through the blockchain. Uh, but that just scratches the surface of kind of, you know, where we think it's headed, right? You know, look at, look at half the debt market where, you know, a lot of these securities are illiquid and don't trade that often anyway. So it's not about necessarily improving liquidity, but about, you know, why do we have to do a securitization that takes three weeks to settle? Or why do we have to do a bank deal uh, that takes two weeks to settle? Um, just the improvement of settlement, the improvement of liquidity can throw, you know, debt and equity uh, on its head. And then to your point about even asset management and DAOs, like, you know, I don't know if, if you'll need um, to outsource to uh, a manager one day in the future, you know, potentially you everything is on chain, and you're just mimicking strategies uh, on chain that investors are doing on their own. So, you know, we've given a lot of thought to this. I think some of it is more, you know, we, you need a lot more pipes and infrastructure built out before you get there. Some of the things are, are more uh, uh, near term. Um, you know, we've given a lot of thought to the decentralization and the governance uh, uh, factors, meaning, um, you know, a lot of DAOs aren't really DAOs, right? We, we use the word decentralized autonomous organization. Most of them are really just organizations. They're not at all autonomous. They're not at all decentralized. They're working towards getting decentralized and autonomous, but but really, you know, it's it's a challenging structure, right? There's a reason that most companies start with a CEO and a single kind of you know monarchy where one person makes decisions because in the early days you need that, and then maybe three or five or ten years later, the the company or business is kind of you know is what it is at that point and it can run in a more autonomous, decentralized nature, but it certainly can't start that way. And I think uh, you know Commissioner Hester Peirce uh, from the SEC probably had it right with with the three-year safe harbor that she wrote a year ago that for some reason is still being held up in the SEC. But that's the right idea, which is very few projects are going to start like Bitcoin or Ethereum where they're basically decentralized on day one. Most of them are going to start centralized. A single person or a group of people start it, they build it out, and then eventually it, it starts to lean more decentralized and more autonomous. Um, I think that's probably the best way to solve for the current issues we have with a lot of these, you know, quote unquote DAOs. And if we get there, then yeah, I think it does turn the whole industry on its head. I think you'll have investing DAOs. I think you'll have, um, you know, single purpose DAOs like Constitution DAO, where you're trying to do, you know, just uh, create something overnight that has a single purpose. Um, and, and it does, it throws a lot of what we're doing uh, on its head. But I think most of the firms and the individuals who have, you know, a front row seat into these developments will be able to adapt and evolve um, as that happens, right? I don't think it's going to be, um, I think you can disrupt without displacing. Um, and I think that's probably what ultimately happens to most of the current incumbents in the space. How are you dealing with the the massive complexity, new issues, new areas growing? You know, because we're talking about all sorts of things. You as an asset management firm suddenly has to gain expertise on all sorts of stuff that's never existed before, figure out on the fly and try and make some money from it. How the hell are you doing that? Because, you know, all of our heads have exploded now, you know, all of us who've been in the space for a while, because there's now too much going on, right? You either have to be an NFT expert, or you need to be a layer one expert or whatever, because it's this, or a DeFi expert, it's just so complex. How, how the hell are you dealing with this? Yeah, I mean, you know, you mentioned like, what were we doing in 2018, when it was a bear market, right? It was easier because you could, you, you know, we knew the entire digital asset market in 2018, there was nothing that was issued that we didn't know, because there wasn't that much going on. And now there's way too much going on for anybody to be on top of. Um, and, and it's it's funny, because again, this is why I say I think the digital asset market is more of a technology underpinning all asset classes than it is an asset class itself. Because, you know, if you're a long short equity manager, 
you wouldn't be expected to go on TV and talk about the corporate bond market, right? Or, you know, you wouldn't be asked to go on TV and talk about what's happening with nickel and silver, right? But in the digital asset world, that's exactly what happens, right? If you have a digital asset fund, one person's asking you to go talk about Bitcoin, the other person's telling you to go talk about DeFi, the other person's asking you to go talk about NFTs. It's like, it's impossible. wait a minute, just because I'm in this space doesn't mean I have to be an expert on every area of this space. Um, but what we do as a firm is, you know, we're investing heavily into people. Um, you know, when we started Arco, it was like six, seven people. You know, now we have over 40 people and about half of them work on the asset management side, which is, you know, managing the, 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 the five structures that we have today. Uh, and about half of them are in marketing, legal, compliance, business development, labs, um, you know, really trying to push the envelope on, on where we go from here. Um, and I think that's going to continue, right? One of the things we've learned over and over again is that there is a, a operational intensity with regard to doing anything in digital assets, right? It's brand new. Um, there's no banks and brokerages or prime brokers, right? All the service providers are brand new. <clears throat> um, all the exchanges are brand new. The OTC dealers are brand new. The auditors are brand new. The fund administrators are brand new. So, you know, having a huge focus on kind of operational compliance and understanding the pipes and the workflows is probably more important today than actually understanding every single token or every single sector. Um, it's okay to be like, hey, I've never heard of that. You know, maybe we'll, if we have time, we'll look into it. You know, I don't think the expectations are realistic to think that everybody in this space should or could know everything that's happening in this space. I think what we do is we train people to be very good filters of information, right? Start top down. What themes do you really think are going to matter in blockchain? And let's make sure we canvas those themes and know who's in it. Um, you know, once we hear about a token, let's go figure out, you know, what competitors are out there. What else is, you know, doing something similar? Um, and if there's areas that we just haven't gotten into yet, you know, let's see how it develops. And if it starts to develop and it comes, becomes interesting, then we'll put some manpower on there to, to learn about it. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it's definitely, there is a lot more going on today than there was three, four years ago. And, and, you know, quite frankly, it's not, it's not plausible for one firm to know it all, but also that's where the white space is for all these new individuals. I mean, you know, you're seeing it probably the same as I do. I get, I get resumes every single day from the big bulge bracket, you know, uh, broker dealers from the largest hedge funds, like people want into the space and they should, because there's just more, um, you know, opportunity and, and more, um, areas where just nobody's an expert yet. So come on over, become that expert. You know, let's see, if, let's, you know, you're going to be the one on this show in 12 months talking about some area that neither you or I know anything about. Exactly. Um, so how are you, how do you think about the risk curve in investing? Because I've tried to get people to understand from my perspective that it's no different than the credit markets or the equity markets or anything else, or even the currency markets. There's always a risk curve. There's the lower risk assets, Bitcoin and ETH. And then yep. further out the curve, it's more risky. It doesn't make them worse or better. There could be the issue could be liquidity, or it could be, um, yeah, unproven technology. How, how how do you think about that risk curve when you're thinking about value investing? Because a lot of the value stuff is a little bit less liquid, a little bit further out the risk curve. Yeah, it's it's funny because you immediately jumped to Bitcoin and ETH as being more defensive or or or, or you know less risky, and it's funny because. If you actually break down what Bitcoin is, there's nothing defensive about it, right? It has no cash flows, it has no intrinsic value, it has no yield, but it is viewed as being uh, defensive and and safer because it's bigger, because it's more well known, right? But it's funny because, like, you know, we we were joking before you turned the camera on here that like we're in a macro investor's paradise right now, right? For the first time in a decade, everything in the macro playbook is working: long commodities, long uh, 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 the dollar, right? Long gold. And it's like in, in the equity debt kind of macro world, there are certain things that you just know are going to work, right? And in a period of high uncertainty, global uncertainty, those things we just mentioned are going to work, right? In the equity world, you know, there's a clear a difference between something like a healthcare stock and a utility stock for, and like a bank stock versus like a tech stock, right? It, it, it's sort of clear which ones are defensive, which ones are, are growth, et cetera. In the digital asset world, some things that make sense to me are just not adopted yet by the market. So for instance, like I, I think it's crazy that Bitcoin is viewed as defensive. I think, you know, uh, we mentioned BNB and FTX. To me, those are the ones that should be defensive, right? You know, their volumes skyrocket whenever there's a lot of uncertainty, and that's good for revenues and cash flows. I would think uh, a centralized exchange token should be the defensive token, but it doesn't act that way yet. It doesn't behave that way yet, right? Similarly, I think a gaming token should be defensive, right? You know, how many gamers do you know that like stop gaming when a recession happens? It doesn't happen, right? In fact, they probably play more because they're out of work. Um, like that should be something that eventually is defensive and, and, and a little less risky. 
But of course, that's not the way it plays out, right? A lot of gaming tokens are down 70% the last three months. So I think, I think a lot of it has less to do with the actual characteristics of the tokens. It has more to do with the people who are in this space right now, right? You just don't have kind of clear um, designations yet of the type of investors in this space yet, right? You have a lot of retail investors who treat everything kind of the same. Um, you have a lot of uh, early stage venture investors who are kind of just looking for the next thing, you know, not necessarily focus on the secondary market too much. Um, and you have a lot of macro investors who are, you know, starting to look at cross correlations and, and, you know, using systematic trading, which is why like yesterday was a good example. Like the, the Bitcoin and the NASDAQ moved literally tick for tick yesterday. Um, that doesn't mean the assets themselves aren't differentiated. That just means the investment eyes that are in this space maybe aren't thinking the way they do in the debt and equity world yet. So I think I think that's going to shift over time a lot. I think in two or three years, you're going to clearly see some sectors outperform others in times of uncertainty and times of growth. Whereas right now, it's you know largely just oh, Bitcoin and ETH are safer because they're bigger and better well known. Like okay, fine, that, that makes sense to me. Let's just you know uh, pour our money into Bitcoin and ETH right now and ride it out. Um, so we'll see. I think, you know, yeah, it's this, a lack this... of sophistication in the marketplace, as you say. So that's how it's done. It's, it's basically liquidity. <laughs> it seems to be kind of liquidity yeah. right now is what where the risk curve is. And that's probably wrong. I mean, you know, I just look at the cash flow of ETH versus Bitcoin as well. And you think kind of that feels, ETH feels like it's a, a network that has more value. Yeah, I think I agree. There. I think Ethereum, in, I think Ethereum is one of the safest assets in this market right now because the economic activity doesn't slow down, um, you know, in a recession or in a you know period of uncertainty. The fees are still high enough to support the network, and because of the EIP fifteen fifty nine upgrade last year, it's you know disinflationary and probably heading to deflationary soon with regard to the number of tokens outstanding. Like that fits if you were, if you were trying to check the box of like what is a defensive uh, property. Ethereum checks all the boxes of something that would be defensive, right? It's got high cash flows, has high activity, and it has, and it's deflationary or disinflationary. You know, that's what traditional investors will look at when they start to come into the space, right? In the same way that they look at healthcare and defense, to, uh, you know, stocks and, and and bank stocks in certain ways, they're going to look at something like you know a layer one protocol with high fees and and, and disinflationary or deflationary uh, uh, schedule. So. I think that as that sophistication uh, increases and as you continue to see more and more of these institutional investors come into the space, you'll see things that make more sense actually start to play out. Right now, it's hard, right? Because again, you can you can talk to your blue in the face about what should happen, but it doesn't matter if you know one person just decides to blow out of all their tokens and it goes down 40%. So how do you deal with that? So you've got a core thesis that over time, value is going to get recognized by the market. You kind of use it as a cushion to allocation, you still more kind of top down orientated with the bottoms up backstop? Or, you know, how, how are you how are you dealing with the fact that the market's not fully recognizing this yet? Yeah, in, in some ways, it hurts, right? Because it doesn't behave the way you want to. In some ways, it's helpful, because even though it doesn't behave the way you want it to, you kind of know how it will behave, right? So for example, this has, in my opinion, been one of the easiest uh, uh, investment opportunity sets for hedging, because it's very uncorrelated on the way up. But very highly correlated on the way down, which means you can basically use anything in a long short capacity or you know to buy puts, for example, to hedge some of that downside. Um, you know you can look at the one year returns, for example, and just look at the dispersion that this asset class has had, right DeFi is largely down seventy to eighty percent over the last year. You know Bitcoin is basically flat. Um, you know gaming and, and metaverse tokens are up you know a thousand percent plus. You know, layer one blockchains are all over the place. Some of them are up 100 to 500 percent, you know, from your Lunas to your avalanches. And some of them are down 50 percent from your, you know, uh, legacy, you know, your legacy uh, uh, Ethereum classics or your, uh, uh, you know, polka dots and things like that. So there's been massive, massive dispersion if you look in a longer time frame. But if you look at like a, you know, one week time frame or even a 30 day time frame, the correlations are much higher. Um, so the way Super. we think about it is, you know, over longer periods of time, and, and you know, as much as everybody likes to look tick for tick and likes to look at the price every day, the reality is like very few investors are actually monitoring their performance on a daily or weekly basis, right? Everyone, at least uh, uh, in theory, has a longer time horizon. Over long time, over longer time horizons, it is very easy to construct a portfolio of very uncorrelated or even negatively correlated assets, right? For instance, for example, if you had a basket, if you just had twenty five percent of your assets last year in the currency bucket, which would be Bitcoin and others in the DeFi bucket, in the gaming bucket, and in, um, you know, like a Web3 bucket or a layer one protocol bucket. 
you would have had a pretty uncorrelated diversified portfolio, right? DeFi got hammered, Bitcoin did nothing, gaming and layer ones and metaverse did great. Um, but if you look at it over a two week time period, or you look at it from January 20th to March 10th, which is basically when things got really nasty, you'd be like, that's the worst portfolio ever. It all, it all behaves the same. So I think part of it is just having a longer time horizon and recognizing that the assets themselves really are different. And the characteristics that drive success or failure of these assets are very different. But in short term, you know, periods of uncertainty and, and, and um, you know, macro noise, you just kind of have to accept the fact that it's going to move together and you have to find hedging techniques. I mean, and that happens everywhere. I mean, that, I mm-hmm. wrote a tweet about this yesterday. I mean, basically, in a, in a risk event, everything trades with the correlation of one. It just is how it is, you know. Yeah, and, sure. um, and then once you're outside of that environment, that's when you get, um, you know, better projects doing better, worse ones underperforming and, and creating that whole world. I hadn't realized that there was such a diversion over, over a period of time. So I'm going to go and dig into some of that because that sounds yeah. fascinating. Yeah, we we um, uh, we use a company called uh, General Risk Advisor. So shout out to them. These guys have been doing uh, risk analytics for three decades, and they were the first that really uh, dove into the risk analytics of digital assets. You know, we've been working with them for four and a half years now on you know, looking at different stress tests and correlations and, and, you know, how our market behaves when gold does this or when equities do this or when oil does this. And the reality is like, again, right now you would just be like, oh, of course it's a risk asset. It goes down when equities go down. But if you look at every three or six or 12 month rolling periods over you know, the last five years, there is nothing statistically significant at all. You, you are just flat out guessing. Like I remember back in November, even we were like, uh, oh, maybe we should, you know, use VIX calls to hedge our book. And the reality is like, the VIX went crazy, but digital assets went straight up. And then in December, digital assets went down and the VIX went nowhere. And then in January, the VIX rose again and digital assets went down. It was like, even in a three-month period, it's all over the place. And, and like and, other currencies, it's very Bayesian in distribution, which means it's got passing correlations. You know, one minute, one thing's important. Next minute, something else is important. But they're all passing. And currencies, that's why people find currencies so difficult to value, because there's no single factor. Yeah. I mean, I've been, like I said, I've been writing weekly blogs for five years now. I, I can point to different blogs that I've written over the last five years where I talked about the relationship to the to, to the yuan, the relationship to gold, the relationship to equities, the relationship to Turkish oil. Turkish lira like, we had as well recently. Yeah. I mean, you know, even avocados, you know, I know that's a joke, but like, you know, it's like it is such spurious correlations that, you know, you we, de- we definitely take it seriously. We definitely are looking for these relationships. But the reality is over the longer time horizons, you know, 6, 12, 18 months, it just is not consistent and it's really not relevant. Um, so, you know, like anything, as a risk manager and as a portfolio manager, we're looking for ways to protect our assets and looking for ways to, uh, you know, mit- mitigate downside. Um, but the reality is it's um, th- there's there's no answer because it will change. You know, the next time you and I do this, we'll be talking about something totally different. So to finish up, how are you how are you thinking about the market right now? And how are you allocating in, into it? Are you starting to add risk into the sell off? Are you still cautious? Where, where are you and what are you thinking? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 certainly defer to you and others who've been studying macro longer than I have. But I mean, the macro picture is definitely challenging right now. Like, you know, if you, if you break up the macro picture into four quadrants, right, one being, you know, inflationary boom when inflation is higher and GDP and, and earnings are higher. And then you have like inflationary bust where you have high inflation, but, you know, lower GDP and lower earnings or, you know, uh, disinflationary boom or disinflationary bust, et cetera. You know, pretty much all of the quadrants risk assets and digital assets do well in, except for the deflationary bust, right? When inflation is going down and economic activity is going down. I think it's pretty clear that that's not where we are right now, right? You know, one, we still have inflation going higher. Um, And, you know, we just came out of a fourth quarter with the highest GDP and the highest corporate earnings we've ever seen, certainly in the US, but also other places. So the market is definitely forward looking right now, more so than any time in my career. Like, you know, we've never seen a rate hike cycle where the market basically prices in three years of rate hikes before the first rate hike even happens, right? Um, We've never seen that before, right? If you look at 2016 to 2018, or you look at, um, you know, uh, 2004 to 2007, you know, these rate hike cycles are three to four years, and generally markets do really well throughout them. And only at the very end, when when the central banks go too far and too fast, do you start to see a real correction, and that's when you see a recessionary environment. Right now, we haven't even pulled liquidity out of the system yet. We haven't even raised rates once, it's certainly here in the U.S. And, even and the yield curve's almost place. inverted. <laughs> We're already inverted, right? So we, we, the market has completely fully priced in three years of rate hikes and a recession before it's even happened. Um, that's, that's challenging, right? We've, we've never seen it before. There's no historical precedent. And 
Um, quite frankly, I'm not even sure digital assets are affected by rising rates because there is no terminal value, right? If we're doing present cash flow analysis, the, the reason rising rates hurt you know, DCF analysis is because of that terminal value. We, we don't even have a terminal value in digital assets. These are perpetual you know, cash flow machines. So rising rates shouldn't hurt it. Um, you know, at the same time, uh, even if you have a recession, like I said, like are gamers going to stop gaming because of a recession? Probably not, right? Is DeFi activity going to slow down because of a recession? Probably not. So intuitively, there's not a lot that I'm seeing in the macro world that makes me think it should have a long-term impact on digital assets. At the same time, it's so scary right now <laughs> with what we're seeing that it's difficult. So so what we're trying to do is, I'll just answer the question quickly and then I'll let you jump in. Like, what we're trying to do is just consolidate into best ideas uh, and, and try to be very, try to find pure play themes, right? Like for instance, if you believe in the growth of stable coins, um, which you should because it's gone from zero AUM to almost 200 billion in the last two years, there's only two ways to play that, right? You either buy Circle Equity who owns USDC or something. We're looking for things like that. What are pure play ways to bet on the growth of gaming, to bet on the growth of stable coins, to bet on the growth of DeFi? Um, and, and that's where we're consolidating assets right now. I'm fascinating. And yeah, I mean, I was looking at the macro picture and I just think, okay, the actual markets, you know, Bitcoin and ETH use that as the as the guide, made their low last year. We've thrown 8% inflation. We've thrown a war. We've thrown nine rate hikes priced in at one point, and it yeah. didn't make a new low. I'm like, what the fuck else can you throw at this? So <laughs> it's interesting to me. It's kind of like, okay, the if there's a signal, it's very much like the signal we got in March 2020. So yeah. maybe wrong, maybe early, but it feels like that because, you know, this inflation stuff is, is I think, difficult for, them, for the market to deal with. But my guess is that economic growth falling is very easy for Bitcoin to deal with because quite simply, when, when that happens, the central banks come back into play. So even though I haven't talked about Bitcoin a lot, I think I actually think there's a there's a there's a world right now where Bitcoin is at 100 or 200,000 in a year from now. And we're all looking back and saying, well, that was obvious. And they're going to point to February 2022 as the reason for that, because in, in February 2022, we had Canada basically sanction its own citizens. We had Russia kill its own economy right through the actions of you know one leader basically killing their stock market and their credit worthiness and then you had the us and europe implying sanctions across the world and i think every single person who is looking at anything from you know the us dollar to the euro to you know equities to to digital assets is saying to themselves i think i need to rethink what money means and and, and what government involvement means and and i think matt levine at bloomberg put it best when he was said everybody used to think of money as as your asset and now we're learning that money is not your asset, it's someone else's liability. And whether or not you have the ability to call on that liability is now thrown into question. You know, will your bank or brokerage account actually give you your money? Will your government allow you to access your money? And again, I think there's a world where Bitcoin is you know, at 5 trillion or even close to 10 trillion like gold in the next couple of years. And we're looking back and saying, well, yeah, that was obvious. February, 2022 was an absolute turning point in terms of how people think about money and assets. Yeah, I mean, the very reason I got into Bitcoin in 2013 or 2012, 13, that period, was because of Cyprus. Yeah. And it was exactly the same thing. It just the, the light bulb moment went, which was you don't own your money because mm -hmm. Europeans had agreed that bank bail-ins were the best way of, of um, dealing with runs on a bank. And what bank bail-in is, for people who don't know, is basically the depositors – are the next line of defense. And yep. they just take it out of the bank account. And that was the reason I got into Bitcoin. And we hadn't had a stress like that until now. And now it's writ large because it's to nation states. Yeah, and, and it's and it's everywhere, right? For different reasons, right? Like I said, Canada, the US, the EU, Russia, like it is everywhere at once, people are coming to that same realization that you don't actually own your money. And I, that's a really powerful statement that might be getting lost right now because of the inflation numbers and because of the war. But at some point, we're coming out of this, and every single person from the you know the 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 poor and the you know those who have very little assets to the ultra you know mega you know wealthy are coming to the same conclusion right now, which is like, I don't know what the system is supposed to look like, but it's not supposed to look like the one we have today, <laughs> and this is not okay. And there has to be a better system, and and you know we're staring at that better system right in the face right now, and. 
you know, I hope people who listen to, to your show and I hope people who, who read the stuff we write and, and look elsewhere, I hope they're all coming to that same conclusion right now, which is that there actually is a better way. And you don't need to put all of your wealth into it, but you definitely need to have some of your wealth into it. And whether it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or other digital assets, like this idea of owning your own assets is really important and really powerful. And again, I would not be shocked if 2022 is a banner year for digital assets, despite the slow start. Uh, and again, we would look back on February and say, yeah, that was obvious in retrospect. Yeah, we've talked about two really big concepts for people today. One was the fact that the tokenization of all communities, businesses, all of this. And then the other, which is you need to own your own money. Those two things are sound like small statements, but the more you think about them, the more gigantic they are. And I think if there's, if there's one big takeaway, it's for people to understand those two things. Yeah, for sure. And very well said. Jet, amazing, my friend, as ever. Really good conversation. And uh, let's see what happens to the market because we don't know, but we'll, we'll see whether we're finding a bottom or we've got another flush down to go. We'll see. But thanks again for having me. Always great talking to you, Raul. Yeah, fabulous. Take care. Hey there, visionaries. Your free membership to Real Vision Crypto, the world's premier source for cryptocurrency and digital asset analysis, is available right now at realvision.com forward slash crypto.